Anthony Shadid was, I would argue, the premier foreign journalist of his time. Um, he, he did in-depth journalism in places in the world that we often don't pay attention to. He also did the kind of journalism that we value, thoughtful, careful, um, considerate, and really serving the public's interest. The people that we have as finalists this year really brought tremendous strength of character to the decisions that they made. And these were tough decisions. We started investigating fraud in the addiction treatment industry. The numbers of people that were dying of overdoses just kept increasing, doubling, tripling. And a lot of us went back and forth on let's, you know, let's use first names only, or maybe we shave the faces out, but we just, we, we came to the realization that that wasn't the way to do it. The way to do it was to paint these addicts of, of who they were. They were human beings with faces and names and hopes and dreams. Really what we were looking for with this project was change. We wanted to wake people up. Is putting the faces out worth the anguish that we are going to create? I mean, there were families we talked to um, who had never told other loved ones that the person who had died um, had um, an addiction issue or who had died of heroin. It's okay to cry when you're on the job. That's one thing that that I learned early on when you're on the phone with these uh, families and relatives talking to them about their, about their loved ones. Once we started making these phone calls, we found that uh, the majority of families were so glad, like, yes, I'll, I'll let, let me tell you, let me tell you about my son. Venezuela bans reporters in places like hospitals and schools and reporters aren't really welcome in food lines and it's not really safe to go into slums. But we wanted to get into all of those places to really tell the story of what was happening in daily life here. I was reporting on food lines for one of these stories and an elderly woman collapsed in my arms. We did have a situation where a video reporter who was working on one of these stories was held at gunpoint for 30 minutes leaving a source's house. And we decided not to tell her about that because we didn't want her to feel guilty for what happened. We told sources far ahead of time whenever a story was going to run. Um, so that they could kind of make their own plans when source decided to leave the country before a story went public. And to be a hardcore reporter, you don't have to put the story above everything. So you don't have to watch a child die to write about medical shortages. You don't have to leave an old woman in the street if she falls down while you're out reporting. Um, you don't have to force a teenage girl to do an interview with you if she hasn't eaten all day. We spent nearly a year looking at allegations of sexual assault and harassment at private schools across New England. So I've been a reporter for more than 20 years, and this series of stories contained more ethical challenges than I think any other series has that we've ever encountered. When and how do we name people who are accused of abuse? Often these are people who've never been convicted of a crime. So when is it fair to name them in a story? If we didn't name them, we would be accused of covering up sexual abuse. If we did name them, uh, we'd be accused of really lodging very serious allegations against people who hadn't been convicted of a crime. We only name them if there was firm documentation, for instance, schools on the record, uh, confirming they investigated and fired a teacher. It was a very tricky situation and no decision that we made could probably, could possibly please everyone. The intention of the stories was to try to give some insight into the phenomena of honor killing, to try to understand what brought that person to, to where he could take a gun and shoot his sister and kill her. While I wanted to tell the story, I also wanted to, didn't want to be giving a platform as such to the, the, the perpetrator to uh, justify. But at the same time, I wanted to get into the, the mindset My story investigated uh, private prisons. Uh, these are corporate-run, for-profit prisons. These prisons are uh, run by companies, so the uh, public access laws that give us limited information about 
most prisons don't apply here. I took a job as a, as a prison guard uh, in Louisiana at Wynn Correctional Center, and I worked there for four months. There was a lot of violence, uh, stabbings every week. There was an escape while I was there. I jumped over a fence in the middle of the day um, when he was in view of guard towers, and uh, there were actually no guards in the towers. They had been removed years ago to save money. A ground rule from the beginning was that I would never lie throughout this process. I decided early on that um, I was not going to spend time with people outside of work. Um, I didn't want to, you know, essentially be uh, befriending them. Um, that felt to me um, too deceptive. Sometimes we have to resort to extraordinary means uh, to get the story, um, but even when that's the case, we can do it carefully and responsibly and ethically. The story that I was investigating for over two years involved the gang rape of more than 50 little girls aged 11 months to 18 years old uh, in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. It, it didn't really take long for me to, to form in my mind um, who the perpetrator was, and in fact it was a member of parliament. When I got in touch with one of the investigators on the case, when there finally was an investigation going on, someone told me that the arrests actually were going to take place in the next couple weeks. And I wrote my long form piece and I waited. And uh, a month went by, two months, and finally five months. And I wasn't sleeping at this point. I was thinking every night, you know, what do I do? How can this keep going? And four more little girls had been kidnapped and gang raped in that time. And I spoke with my editors um, about the idea of writing an op-ed before publishing the other story. And what I would write in it was not, you know, name names, not name who the suspected perpetrator was, but basically flat out say to the government of Congo, I know who's doing this, and I know you know who's doing this, so if you don't go ahead and take some action, I'm going to reveal who I believe the suspect is, and it's going to make you look really bad. Four hours later, the arrest warrants were issued after three years, and 12 hours later, this member of parliament and 67 of his militiamen were in custody. So we have some bedrock ethics in journalism, truth-telling, independence, minimizing harm. But when you read these entries, you come to understand that those bedrock principles are a great foundation, but we're always trying to figure out how to apply them in new situations. It's going to be a hard balance between objectivity and just duties as a human being. I really believe that this uh, kind of work is crucial, that international journalism has a serious role to play in human rights and in finding justice. Our job is to hold power accountable, to find abuses of power and shed light on them. And hopefully by telling these stories, we can make sure the system works better, give a voice to people who otherwise wouldn't have it, and help lead to real reform that will help make a difference in people's lives.